Hello and welcome to SBS335. This is Juan Jose Gutierrez and we're moving right along. This is uh, Unit 1. Uh, this is the third module. And today we're going to be talking about um, uh, digital ethnographies, but more specifically, we're going to be talking about diverse uh, digital worlds. They, I think the concept was already introduced in the first very few uh, first uh, chapters of the book. And uh, we can start, it's not that you are not aware of it, we'll just start sort of seeing it more clearly, how diverse and complex the digital world will be. We have thus far explored the very concept of the digital as opposed to the uh, physical face-to-face -face world. We've been um, exploring a little bit the extent to which anthropologists have had to reconfigure their thoughts about doing work in this new arena uh, and uh, we have a, we have learned how in many aspects it shouldn't be different but on the other hand it's definitely a new media and uh, there are new behaviors and new elements to consider that require our consideration um we have for example uh went in depth uh, particularly with the second module into considering uh, disabilities and the and the new digital era, and how a disabled person can be ostracized and uh, and can be set aside by the media, or it can very well be um, enabled and uh, and their abilities potentiated. So I I thought that was a really interesting, refreshing perspective. And if you think of it, we can apply this to a number of aspects of the social reality that uh, that can and are com comparable to um, to the experience that a disabled person can have on the on the internet. Uh, this is very much so what we refer to when we talk about the the haves and have-nots, the gap, and uh, and the digital divide. That's what it is. So. Um, it's not the same to be fully connected um, on a social environment where technology is, is ever present all over the place or uh, living in societies where this is just not the case and then you have less opportunities. And since m many of the activities that humans are engaged in today are moving into this digital arena, and so it is very important for us to keep an eye on it not only because of the moral um, importance of considering it, which is in and of itself um, sufficient, but because we need to be vigilant about the, the consequences of, of this distance that is being created, created um, amongst those who actually have access to the resources and those who do not. And uh, so what are the consequences of that, if any? And um, I think a part of what we're going to be doing this semester is is um, uh, gaining a sense of, of what just this difference is. Um, today we're going to be going deeper into an, an aspect that I briefly introduced in the last module, which is this idea of a social networking site. And, um, and what's the relevance and just what those are, right? What, what are the network, networking sites out there? Now, our lives are increasing, increasingly digital, right? So there's no question that we do more and more things uh, online uh, these days. And uh, so that's a reality for, for for many, for not, not, not for all, but for, for very many. So when that's the reality for the vast majority of the people, then it is worth uh, asking who's defining the agenda in that world, who's defining the rules of, of engagement, and, um, and just what is the nature of this world that we're living. So some of the new notions that we have uh, to grapple with and that uh, we're kind of used to talk about is this idea of a, a global village where we can have conversations all over the, the planet about things that are meaningful and real. 
e-commerce who hasn't done any any purchasing online i think i bet all of us have uh, have already done that and if you haven't let me know because I'd, I'd love to hear more about your experience but most people has already done that done that and then there's also an increasing um, use of this means to connect people in in interesting and, and efficient ways oftentimes in terms of um, of uh, of the business of of the public realm in, in what we call the e-governance right but here's the thing this uh, idea that technologies are changing the way humans interact is by no means a new concept so I want to take you back to the 1950s and show you how scientists, social scientists and, um, and people in, invested in, in media were uh, thinking about <coughs> what this revolutionary means of communication known as the radio and the television were having a, an impact on the way people relate to each other, the way people learn about things and the way people communicate. You will see how many of the questions and concerns that they used to have are very similar to the ones that we're proposing uh, to have uh, because of the new digital media. So let's, let's take a listen. Well, there they are. Our new electronic media or our new gadgets. You push a button and the world's yours. You know how they talk about the world getting smaller? Well, it's thanks to these that it is. Everywhere is now our own neighborhood. We know what it's like to go on safari in Kenya or to have an audience with the Pope, to order a cognac in a Paris cafe. But not only is the world getting smaller, it's becoming more available and more familiar to our minds and to our emotions. The world is now a global village. A global village. Well, if the appliance store is the symbol of the age uh, we're living in now, uh, what about the symbol of the age just past? Because in contrast to all of this, we used to have just one medium, or one gadget, if you like. John? Come on around. You're in a bookstore in the hallowed, respectable center of the age of print, the age of the book. In the appliance store, you're very much the electronic man. Here. You go back to being a renaissance man, literary man. A book. It's all we used to have. There were no film projectors, no TV sets or radios. We got all our information from this. We were educated by it. We learned about each other from it. The book was the source of our fame. We lived, loved, and died, as the saying goes, by the book. Think for a minute of uh, how one reads. One sits alone. One's eye scans a line at a time. The author's ideas come to you one at a time off the page. It's a private experience. It's not a community or family activity. You do this alone. The uh, electronic media haven't wiped out the book. It's read and used and wanted, perhaps more than ever. But the role of the book has changed. It's no longer alone. It no longer has sole charge of our outlook nor our sensibilities. Of course, the trouble is we act as though we were still solely in the age of the book. Our notions of right and wrong, our regard for one another, for education, diplomacy, politics, religion, all belong to the literary man. And perhaps that's why literary man finds things today coarse or corrupt or materialistic. He hears the sound of fighting in the street, of the uh, rock and tumble of life. Sometimes he hears the sound of music and uh, he finds it all rather vulgar. <laughs> With me now is Marshall McLuhan. Well, Marshall, you've done a considerable amount of writing about media. Uh, what does this all mean, the uh, book world that we had and the electronic world we have? I think the best distinction, Alan, might be found in the phrase, With it. You know how we speak of being with it, meaning we've understood completely. We, we've got the message, as it were, in every way possible. But in the older book or print culture, people were not with it. They were away from it by themselves with their own private point of view. 
Now, you have no point of view when you're with it because you accept the thing totally. And we're with it because these new media of ours, the one you talked about in the appliance store, have made our world into a single unit. The world is now like a continually sounding tribal drum where everybody gets the message all the time. A princess gets married in England and boom, boom, boom go the drums. We all hear about it. An earthquake in North Africa, a Hollywood star gets drunk, away go the drums again. I use the word tribal. It is probably the key word of this whole half hour. Why, Marshal, do you use the word tribal? Why, why this? Well, I think you'll find everything we observed tonight about the media uh, points in the direction of tribal man and away from individual man. Now, by individual man, I assume that you're referring to John's literary man. Yes, uh, and, and tribal man is the man created by the new electronic media. So that this would be the basic change we spoke of at the beginning. Yes, we're retribalizing. Involuntarily, we're getting rid of individualism. We're in the process of making a tribe. For just as books and their private point of view are being replaced by the new media, so the concepts which underlie our actions, our social life, are changing. We are no longer so concerned with self-definition with finding our own individual way. Uh, what the group, we, we're more concerned with what the group knows, of feeling as it does, of acting with it, not apart from it. Look, uh, let's back up just a bit, Marshal. Uh, no. If more books are being used, more being sold, uh, the libraries are crowded, they're busy, how can it be said, aside from what else may be happening, that we're moving out of a print culture? As John said, uh, books are still very important, but their role is changing. The nature of their importance is changing. Remember that books were our first teaching machine. And during the Renaissance, our only teaching machine. Books are what gave the Renaissance its peculiar stamp. We had to see the world and each other's through the printed line on the page. And today, there are many media of information, many teaching machines. By teaching machines, I take it that you're not referring only to those found in the classroom. No, no, no. We, we learn everywhere. The book's role has diminished <clears throat> because of all the other actors. It's no longer king, but subject. We owe a lot to the book. The assembly line of mass production, that, for example, comes to us from the book, from the printed line where things move along and happen one at a time. But the assembly line has changed. It is no longer one thing at a time, but wherever possible, everything at once. 40 or 50 operations happening at the same time, controlled and synchronized exactly by preset type. Take. Notice the shift in the image. From the assembly line stretched out, events taking place one at a time, to the modern automated industrial complex where things happen all at once. Bang. Not a line, but a field. And this applies not only to products, but to people. The line, the individual, the event was the book, the field, the all at once, tribal drum, the new media. Yes, but uh, I mean, our media, uh, is any medium that strong that it can affect our lives and our whole outlook, Marshall? Uh, aren't media, as I think most of us feel, on the edges of life? Uh, they can be taken or left alone. Well, Alan, we've seen how print affected all aspects of our lives. Industry, education, the concept of the modern army even. Our managerial class is a product of print culture. So is the idea of romantic love. The media are at the heart of our life because the media work through our senses. And print is a medium. Uh, it changed our sense makeup from what it had been in the Middle Ages. And now certainly these other media will do the same. They, the photo photo uh, photograph, movies, radio, TV, all these uh, change at once the way in which we see or hear or touch or feel ourselves and our world. A slight change of one of our five senses alters the ratio among the rest. People suddenly begin to want and appreciate different things. They begin to think differently. All right, but let's uh, get back to your earlier word, tribal, Marshal. Uh, why should all of this talk about media mean that individual man is on the way out and tribal man is on the way in? I mean, why is the big change taking place? To answer that, let's get back to the major, for he illustrates the changes brought about by media in the clearest way, especially if we contrast the teenager with his old-time contemporary, the adolescent. Whoa. <laughs> You mean there's a difference between the adolescent and the teenager? Yes, and I'd say it's the same kind of difference as that between book culture and the electronic era. The adolescent corresponds to the world of the book, the teenager to the electronic era, 
The adolescent is seeking self-definition, seeking to isolate his uniqueness from that of others, seeking to relate his self uh, to others. The adolescent knew he wasn't an adult. He knew he was in life's waiting room, that his life was not really real life. That would begin only with adulthood. For those of you that are not familiar with uh, Marshall McLuhan, McLuhan, he is a uh, he was a philosopher, a Canadian philosopher, whose uh, main interest was in exploring the impact that mass media had on uh, on individuals. And mass media was in the 1950s a uh, major topic of reflection uh, all over the planet. But um, I just think it's fascinating to see how some of the as I was saying, some of the questions that people had in the 50s are repeating today. According to, uh, to McLuhan, the, um, the concern was that um, there was uh, a new tribalism in the making that was doing away with individualism, which if you, if you have um, this present, individualism was the philosophy of, uh, of uh, liberal thinking that was prevailing in the Western world in the 1950s, it was opposed to this idea of uh, communistic or socialistic uh, ideas that uh, that most uh, philosophers and economists and politicians would agree that was not uh, something to to long for. But the the question is that to what extent we have ever become truly uh, and solidly individualistic, and uh, uh, at what time we left. Um, our tribal ways, and uh, even an, a person that is reading a book is reading a book in the context of um, of a classroom, in the context of uh, individuals that he or she is relating to. So I think it's a little bit questionable whether or not we we live completely isolated, and whether tribalism has only a negative connotation. Of course, it does has a negative connotation. In, to the extent that uh, we've been manipulated. And that's the main concern of our days, to what extent we have lost uh, sight of, um, of being critical, to what extent we can be manipulated by forces into voting in certain ways, into thinking in certain ways. Some of that might be happening because uh, uh, folks invest a lot of money into the digital media in sending messages that that shape our understanding of the world. But on the other hand, it is also true that um, we have the ability to be critical about it. And maybe that's the main the main um, concern that we should have today. So um, can we be critical and not just be manipulated by by the by the forces that are moving the new uh, digital realm? Some of the myths, though, that uh, um, the readings are helping us uh, explore is the extent to which the new media tools that we use are really helping us become a tribe and, and it unites us. Is, is it true that we're more united or we just have a sense that we're united but in reality we're actually being atomized, it's a sent into into dispersion so that we're less powerful. Another myth that we need to uh, explore is the extent to which all these new tools and, and, and access through the new media will help create and distribute more, more equally and equitably the wealth of the planet. And then to what extent uh, the new media is helping people coming together. And if we just look at the growing polarization of the political realm in the U.S. and elsewhere. Uh, you you tend to wonder to what extent the new media is is helping creating conditions of conversation, and I see less and less of that, and that's certainly a concern. Um, I love this uh, rap that I'm going to show to you to lighten up the presentation because it really brings that reflection about what uh, the new media is actually doing to people. Let's take a listen. Did you know the average person spends four years of his life looking down at a cell phone? 
Kinda ironic, ain't it? How these touch screens can make us lose touch. But it's no wonder in a world filled with IMAX, iPads, and iPhones, so many eyes, so many selfies, not enough us's and we see. Technology has made us more selfish and separate than ever. Cause while it claims to connect us, connection has gotten no better. And let me express first, Mr. Zuckerberg, not to be rude, but you should reclassify Facebook to what it is, an anti-social network. Cause while we may have big friend lists, so many of us are friendless all alone Cause friendships are more broken than the screens on our very phones We sit at home on our computers measuring self-worth by numbers of followers and likes Ignoring those who actually love us, it seems we'd rather write an angry post And talk to someone who might actually hug us, am I bugging? You tell me, cause I asked a friend the other day, let's meet up face to face they said, all right, what time you wanna Skype? I responded with OMG, SRS, and then a bunch of SMHs and realized, what about me? Do I not have the patience to have conversation without abbreviation? This is the generation of media overstimulation. Chats have been reduced to snaps. The news is 140 characters. Videos are six seconds at high speed. And you wonder why ADD is on the rise faster than 4G LTE, but Get a load of this, studies show the attention span of the average adult today is one second lower than that of a goldfish. So if you're one of the few people or aquatic animals that have yet to click off or close this video, congratulations. Let me finish by saying you do have a choice, yes. But this one, my friends, we cannot autocorrect. We must do it ourselves. Take control or be controlled, make a decision, me. No longer do I want to spoil a precious moment by recording it with a phone I'm just gonna keep them I don't want to take a picture of all my meals anymore I'm just gonna eat them I don't want the new app, the new software, or the new update And if I want to post an old photo Who says I have to wait until Thursday? I'm so tired of performing in the pageantry of vanity And conforming to this accepted form of digital insanity Call me crazy, but I imagine a world where we smile when we have low batteries Cause that'll mean we'll be one bar closer To humanity